I want to talk about the case of uh, the murder of two innocents in the matter of Troy Davis. The first was actually the murder of Mark McPhail. I don't want to forget that. Um, in fact, that's the center of what I'm really trying to talk about. Mark McPhail was the police officer working as a security guard at the Burger King in Savannah who was killed trying to help somebody else. Absolutely did not deserve to die. Troy Davis was the accused, found guilty, and then killed on death row last night, despite some serious doubts. We've got this rule in our justice system in the U.S. based around the idea that someone is guilty if they are found to be so beyond a reasonable doubt. But in the case of the death penalty, we should have a higher standard beyond any doubt. Right? There should be no doubt if we're about to put someone down, off with their heads, inject them with fluids, firing squad, beating squad, whatever, you have to be absolutely sure of what you're about to do. Because if you're wrong, you have compounded one innocent death with the death of another. And that's not the point of the system. And in the case of Troy Davis, not only was it not to the standard of beyond any doubt, there was a preponderance of doubt. Right? Not a preponderance of evidence, a preponderance of doubt. Seven of the nine witnesses ended up recanting and whole or in part their testimony. One of the two remaining who insists that Troy Davis was the killer is himself accused of killing the victim. And more importantly, the evidence was non-existent in terms of any physical evidence. Now, when we decide as a society that we're going to kill somebody, we should be sure of it. I mean, innocents die a lot, and a lot of those deaths are preventable. But on an individual basis, 100% of that death is preventable. So you've got children who die every three seconds due to preventable diseases around the world, and we're fighting that, and it's a worthy fight to step up that effort. You've got people killed in auto accidents every day. You've got folks who fall into manholes or who are killed randomly by individuals like Mark McPhail was. Many of these are preventable, but 100% of them will never get there. We aspire to be there because we're human beings and we want to be better than we were, but we'll probably never get there. But in the case of a single person whose death is backed by the state and thus all of us, we have the power to be sure. And in the absence of that certainty, we have the obligation to say no, to live and let live, to keep imprisoned, but to let live because we might be wrong, because we've got enough evidence showing that innocent people have been salvaged from death row. So we know we've been wrong. We know the system is discriminatory. So what do you do in this case? You know, you look at the case of war, and that is collective murder, right? We strap up and gun up our young and generally poor people to go attack somebody else's young and generally poor people and kill them. And we also set up our own to be killed by them. But there's a risk, and there's a different math involved even in that. And I'm not trying to be pro-war. I'm just trying to weigh these decisions. In that case, you're saying that the risk of inaction, of not going to war, far outweighs the risk of inaccuracy of being wrong about the decision to go to war. Because if we don't do anything, if we don't go to war, we could be wiped out, we could be ended, or we could suffer severe losses. But that math does not work in the case of an individual locked in a jail cell by the state of Georgia or Texas or any other 34 states in these United States that have the death penalty. That person's threat has been neutralized. Troy Davis isn't going to fly planes into buildings. You know what I'm saying? He's not going to raid our homes. He is not going to do any more harm than he possibly already did. And the idea of punishing for possible actions is a slippery one and a dangerous one and an absolute mistake when you add death to the equation. So he possibly killed this police officer, so we absolutely are going to end his life. Now, if you possibly cheated on me, I don't absolutely go cheat on you. I try to find out more, and if I'm not sure, maybe we have a little distrust, but we live to have another relationship out of it. We have such wonderful ideas of ourselves as human beings. We think we have come such a far away from our barbaric past. But cases like the death penalty in general, and Troy Davis in particular, remind us that we're not too far from that Roman Colosseum when the thumbs up of the senator preserved your life and the thumb down led to your death. We've come a long way in many ways. We have iPhone 5s and airplanes, which is magic. They're magic. But when it comes to the execution of justice in a collective case around the life of an individual, we resort to myth and fear and vengeance and not 
morality and right and wrong, which we have the power to do. And that's my argument. We have the power in this case to prevent the death of an innocent and certainly not to end the life of a possibly guilty person. And we fail to do so. So when you account for one innocent life, the life of Mark McPhail, with another innocent life, the life of Troy Davis, justice is not served. In fact, injustice is served. We have increased the level of injustice in the society that we live in and in the world that we're trying to create. And that's the exact opposite point and goal and mission of the justice system. So we've collectively failed, and that's sad today, and hopefully we will take that sadness and continue to think about how we apply these collective decisions in these individual cases where we have the power to be absolutely right, and when we're wrong, to do the right thing and do nothing. I'm Baratunde Thurston. Thanks for listening.